What a week, huh? Schools aren't meeting. Conferences are not convening. Players aren't playing. And congregations are not gathering. I don't know when we've seen a week quite like this. What do you think God is saying to us? What is God saying to us? A couple of answers come to my mind as I've thought about that question. I believe that God is talking to the world. And I believe he's testing the church. He's talking to the world. He's saying, come to me. Depend on me. Your life on earth is fragile and brief. I believe God is telling this to the world. He's reminding us that he and he alone is the source of comfort, fulfillment, and meaning. And all those times we thought we could trust the economy. And all those times we thought that real fulfillment would come with the right cruise or the right trip. He's reminding us. He's talking to us. And he's testing the church. He's testing to see if we will be the people he wants us to be. Will we be people of faith? Will we be people of generosity? This is a unique window. This is a unique window in this generation of the church. He's testing us. He's testing us to see if we will be people of faith. If we will lean into him. If we will trust him. If we will believe in him, that all those words that many of us have said all of our lives, if we'll truly believe that he is in control, that we will believe that God is never sometimes sovereign, but that he is always sovereign. It's a test. And also I think he's testing, he's testing our generosity. While everybody else isolates, hoards, gets defensive and protective, will we be the, will we be the people who reach out? who share just today while stopping to get a cup of coffee at a favorite spot. I noticed that on the entrance to the men's room was a note that had been taped to the door and said, if you are in need of toilet paper, come and talk to us. I went and asked the lady, I said, what's going on? She said, well, people come in and they're stealing toilet paper. I don't get the deal with toilet paper. And I really don't get the deal with stealing toilet paper. When the world is under stress, many people go underground. It's time for the church to go out. To be that voice of encouragement. To be that one who remembers the elderly who live down the street. Who makes a call to the person who may be all by themselves. Will we be generous? Will we be generous and continue to give our resources? The homeless needs are going to go up. Uh, people may get sicker. There may be some people who need somebody just to be spontaneously, anonymously kind to them. Churches, they're going to continue. We've got to keep giving to our churches. Keep blessing one another. So I think God is talking to the world. I think God is testing the church. And I believe that he is absolutely in control. And we're going to get through this. And we're going to learn a few things as a result. One thing we've learned is to be flexible when it comes to sermon selection. We're in the book of James, and uh, I had intended to present a message based on the third chapter of the book of James. And the title of that particular message was Taming the Tongue. Well, I still think that's a good message, but I'm going to save that for another time. I talked to Travis and we decided that it would be more appropriate to have a message that would speak directly to the fears and the anxieties that we're facing. And so in just a moment, I'm going to reacquaint us with one of the great stories of the Old Testament. Speaking of Travis, he's just coming in off of a family vacation. He's enjoyed a week with his family at Disney World and we're thankful that the Lord has given him this time of rest and we're prayerful that all he brings back from Disney World are some good souvenirs and memories. And he'll be uh, resting and catching up and be back, Lord willing, this time next week. Lord, let your blessings be upon us now as we open your Bible, we open your word. May we open our hearts 
to receive whatever it is that you have to say to us. Through Christ we pray. Amen. The boy leans down and looks into the creek. Were he to take a minute to study his own reflection, uh, he would see a handsome face, ruddy, sunburned from hours in the sun, handsome enough to steal the hearts of Hebrew maidens, but he's not looking for his reflection. He's looking for stones. He wants five of them. Five smooth stones, flat stones, the kind that will fit well in a shepherd's pouch, the kind that will sit securely in the sling of that shepherd as he swings that sling and releases it in the direction of a bear, in the direction of a lion, or in this case, in the direction of a giant. Goliath can hardly keep from laughing as he stands on the other side of the valley and he looks down at that little boy in the creek. Goliath is a big man. Oh my goodness. Nine feet nine inches tall, carrying 160 pounds of armor, snarling like the main event at a wrestling match. He wears a size 20 collar, a size 10 and a half hat, and a 56 inch belt. His biceps burst, his thigh muscles ripple, and his bows belts throughout the valley. And here's what he says. This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. He's been saying this every morning and every evening for 40 days in South Texas parlance. He's saying, send me a man and we will go mano a mano. But nobody shows up. Nobody, that is, until today. Shepherd boy David just showed up this morning. He clocked out of sheep watching to deliver bread and cheese to his brothers on the battlefront. That's where he was when he heard Goliath defying the living God. And that's when David made this decision. Then he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. And he put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had and his sling in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Don't you know that Goliath scoffed at the kid as he approached? In fact, you might say he gave him the nickname Twiggy. He said, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? He looked down at that skinny little fella coming toward him, and it was a classic contrast of power. Skinny, scrawny David, bulky, brutish Goliath. It was the toothpick versus the tornado. What odds do you give David against this giant? Better odds, perhaps, than you're giving us against ours. Our Goliath entered the world not with a boast, but as a virus as a tiny microscopic thief of life. A few months ago, we'd never heard of him. At least I'd never heard of him. Now, we can't go anywhere we don't hear about him. Fear of him has caused events to be canceled, schools to be closed, and the economy to take a nosedive. Now, we know well the roar of this tiny Goliath who has come into our world. We know the fear he stirs and the sleep that he steals but do we know how to face him? Here's my message. The God who helped David is here to help you. You face your giants by facing God even more so, even and especially this giant. All you need are five stones. I've wondered why David selected five. I wonder if the answer is because we have five fingers. And we can use our hands to help us remember the five essential elements in fighting a giant. I'd like for all of us, wherever you are, 
to take a moment and hold up your hand because this is your outline. This is your outline. And we're going to look at the five stones that David used to bring down Goliath. Stone number one is the stone of the past. Stone number one, the stone of the past. You see, when everybody else saw Goliath, they saw nothing but fear. But Goliath jogged a memory in David, and this memory gave David courage. And while everybody else quivered, David remembered. David said to Saul, remember Saul was the king, he said, your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. You see, David remembered as a shepherd how God had brought down the lion and the bear. And so when he saw that challenge, he thought, well, God's already two for two. I think he can handle another one. You see, a good memory makes a good hero. A bad memory makes for a wimp. I wonder, are you remembering what God has done for you? Do you remember? God has got us through times like this before. Do you remember 2008? Do you remember 9-11? Do you remember Black Monday of 1987? The Bible says, remember his marvelous works which he has done. Remember his marvelous works, which he has done. Keep a list of his world records. Has he not walked you through waters before? Has he not proven to be faithful? Have you not discovered his provision? Has he not made roadkill out of other enemies? I want to encourage you to write today's worries in sand and chisel yesterday's victories in stone. This is how we begin going into battle with Goliath. We remember the stone of the past. Pick up the stone of the past. And then, number two, pick up the stone of prayer. Now to move, if you'll notice on your hand, from this thumb to this finger, you've got to go low. David went low before he went high. He went to the lowest spot in the valley before he went to the highest place of battle. As you look at him selecting stones, you try to envision him down there at the creek. Everybody else, everybody else is higher than he is. Everybody. King Saul, higher. Goliath, higher. His brothers, higher. Everybody's at a higher elevation. The other soldiers. But David chooses to go to the lowest point. And that's what God calls us to do. He calls us before we go forth in battle to come before him in prayer. I was so grateful to read that President Trump has designated March the 15th as a national day of prayer because only God can move us through a crisis, but he has done in the past and he will do again. I want to ask you to join me for just a moment in prayer. And I have brought up with me a list of all the members, all the members of the coronavirus advisory team. I want us to pray for this task force and pray for our president by name. Most Heavenly Father, we join our hearts to ask a blessing upon our president, Donald Trump, upon our vice president, Mike Pence, and upon the following members of the task force committee. Robert O'Brien, Robert Redfield, Anthony Fauci, Stephen Began, Alex Azar, Deborah Burks, Jerome Adams, Ken Cuccinelli, Joel Zabat, Matthew Pottinger, Rob Blair, Joseph Grogan, Christopher Liddell, Derek Kahn, Robert Wilkie, and Seema Birma. Grant them wisdom from above and strength from your spirit. Through Christ we pray together. Amen. So you let that finger remind you that you have to go forth in prayer. But then let the tallest finger on your hand remind you of this stone. And that is the stone of priority. You see, David had a different priority than everybody else in the valley. The priority of David was God's renown. 
God's reputation, God's name. In fact, he enters the story discussing God. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should divide the armies of the living God? Look at the first comment of David. Isn't that great? I mean, he walks into the story talking about God. The soldiers never mention God. King Saul never mentions God. The brothers of David never mention God. But David can't talk about anyone except God. Everything he says, every time he opens his mouth, he's talking about God. Remember what I said earlier about what he remembered of the past? He was talking about God. He said, the Lord... The Lord, there he is, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. He will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. He's talking about the Lord. He continues this theme, even with Goliath. Now this is a long text, two verses, 45 through 47. But I don't want to skip a word because look what David says to the giant himself. He says, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down, and I'll cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. No one else talks about God. David doesn't talk about any else, anyone else but God. If I read this story correctly, I find only two references to Goliath, and they're both pretty much the same, what he said to Saul. When he asked, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? He only makes two references to Goliath and neither one are very politically correct. David doesn't ask anything about him. David doesn't ask anything about that big spear. He doesn't ask anything about the size of the shield. He doesn't ask anything about why Goliath has a skull and crossbones tattooed on his bicep. David never asks anything about Goliath, but he talks a lot about God. Here's the list, if I compiled it correctly. He talks about the armies of the living God. He talks about, again, the armies of the living God. He talks about the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. He talks about the Lord who will deliver you from my hand and all the earth will know that there is a God in Israel. He talks about God all the time. The Lord does not save with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. If I count it up correctly, David makes nine references, nine references to God, and he only makes two references to Goliath. In other words, David pondered God four times, twice as much, more than twice as much, nine to two, four, I can get that out, he pondered God twice as much as he thought about the giant. Now, if somebody were to be able to read your thoughts as we have lived with this crisis now for a couple of weeks, and they were to balance and compare the number of times you're thinking about God or talking to God or praising God or worshiping God with the number of times you're focused on this, on this challenge that is facing society, what kind of, what kind of thoughts, what kind of contrast would they discover? Are you giving God more thoughts? Or are you giving the Goliath more thoughts? You see, our thoughts are important. And our challenge in a difficult season like this is thought management. Thought management. It's real simple. A thought is out here. It comes into our ear, goes into our head, and if it's allowed to do so, it goes down into our heart. Jesus said, it is out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So somebody's only speaking words of anxiety and fear, it is because they're not interrupting these thoughts that come into our ear and into our head. David is known as a man of worship. 
He was one who thought much about God, who wrote the great psalms about God. And because of that, he could face a challenge and words came out of him that were words of hope and faith and strength. How does his vocabulary compare with yours? If you're in need of more strength, just look at the battle cry of David. He said, you come to me with the sword, with the spear, and with the javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. Somebody needs to hear this today. Somebody whose school just shut down. Somebody's worried about having a job. Somebody is deathly afraid of death. Somebody needs to shift their attention away from the problem and turn their attention toward the provider. Listen to me. He loves you. God loves you. He has not left you alone to face this on your own. He is with you. Turn to him. Imitate David. Remember David said in this scripture, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. Just a little interesting detail. Armies of Israel? I thought there was just one army of Israel. Maybe David knew that God's armies are comprised of thousands and thousands of unseen angels that God can solicit and recruit the forces of the weather and the wind. Nothing slows him down. He has all kinds of armies around him. David saw the armies of God. And because he did, he reacted with passion. Here's stone number four. The stone of passion. The stone of passion. Look at verse 48 of chapter 17. David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. I'm thinking that David's brothers are closing their eyes right here. I'm thinking that King Saul is going, oh boy, that guy's running to an early death. I'm thinking that Goliath is laughing and all his brood is laughing. And that there's a moment in which Goliath throws his head back and he goes, ho, 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 ho. And when he does, his helmet shifts back just slightly leaving an unprotected spot right here. And dead-eyed David spots it. And he reaches down and he takes one of those stones and he loads his sling and he... And he releases that stone like a missile across the valley of Elah and it hits Goliath right there in the forehead. And Goliath's eyes cross and his knees buckle and down he goes... And the scripture says that David ran right up next to the body of Goliath and he pulled Goliath's sword out of the sheath and he decapitated Goliath. You might say that David knew how to get ahead of his giant. I can hear you laughing out there somewhere. Do you? Do you? When's the last time you ran toward your giant? When's the last time you ran toward your problem? When's the last time you said, you know what? Goliath of anxiety, you're not going to get me. Goliath of despair, you're not going to get me. Goliath of the worst case scenario, I'm not going to assume that. I'm going to trust in the armies of the living God. And consequently, you run in the direction with faith, with courage, Because you have listened to the voice of God. Why don't you take up the voice of passion? And then lastly, one final stone. And that is the stone of persistence. You know the real reason that David selected five stones? It might have to do with the fact that Goliath had four brothers. You have to do a little digging and know where to look for this. But if you were to turn your scripture over to 2 Samuel chapter 21, you would read about four behemoth brothers. (laughs) The names of these guys. My goodness. Ishbi Banab was a descendant of the giants. His bronze spearhead weighed more than seven 
pounds. What a big guy he must have been. Sibekai was on this list, another descendant of the giants. Apparently he was a brother as well. And then there was the brother of Goliath, of Gath, whose spear was as big as a flagpole. All these guys were big. But none of these guys were anything compared to King Kong, brother number four. There was a giant there, Gath, with six fingers on his hands and six toes on his feet, 24 fingers and toes. He was another of those descendants from Rapha. These four were descended from Rapha and Gath. Here's what I'm wondering. Maybe the reason that David quarried a quintet of stones was because he knew that David, I'm sorry, he knew that Goliath had four brothers the size of dinosaurs. And for all he knew, when Goliath went down, those four brothers were going to come over the hill and he had to be ready. He was there. He was going to be persistent. He wasn't going to give up. Listen to me. Sometimes one prayer is not enough. As sometimes one visit to the counselor is not enough. Sometimes one hour in the prayer room is not enough. You just got to keep pulling out the stones. You got to keep pulling out the stones. You got to keep loading up your sling. You got to keep fighting back. I don't know how long this particular challenge is going to last. But I do know that God has given us everything we need for facing it. We're not facing it alone. And don't get discouraged if you get discouraged. Don't beat yourself up if you feel beaten up. If you feel like you're too afraid, too anxious, then just get down on your knees and do what David did. Turn to your heavenly father, asking for help. Remember all those times in the past that he has helped you. Go low before you go high. Go up unto the mountain of prayer. Make God's name your priority. Let your mind be full of his thoughts. Take up the stone of passion and move forward against this challenge. And then just be persistent. I believe God is talking to us. I believe he's talking to the whole world. And I believe he's testing the church. And I believe that God is going to give us everything we need to move forward. We're going to spend a few moments in prayer now. And I'd like to invite you to, to take a few moments. Maybe you'd like to get on your knees by the couch or get on your knees. Maybe you'd like to go into a prayer room. Maybe you'd like to gather your family around and all sit closer together. It, it, however you want to use this prayer time, it's, of course, entirely up to you. But I'm going to offer a prayer and just ask the Lord to help us, to give us strength as we face the challenges that lie ahead. Gracious and holy Heavenly Father, praise to your name. Praise to your name. Praise to your name. You are high above this. You are high above us all. But also you're right here with us. And just as you, Lord Jesus, got into the boat that rode into the storm with your disciples, so, Heavenly Father, you're in the boat with us. We thank you. We welcome your presence, O oh Lord, and we bless you. Father, this challenge is greater than we are. And this, this challenge, this, this virus, is stirring fear that it seems to be even more contagious than the virus itself. You have told us that you have not given us a spirit of fear and timidity. And so, Father, we know that this fear does not come from you. We ask you, O oh Lord, that you'd give us wisdom so we can be prepared, but you'd give us courage so we can be strong. Give us faith. Help us to trust you. To know that you are with us. Help us to remember all the times that you have walked your people through global calamities, whether it be with Joseph in Egypt, how you helped them face the famine, whether it be with prophet Jeremiah in Jerusalem when they endured the banishment, the captivity of the Babylonian nation. Even with our Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, you looked out over that crowd of 5,000 men plus women and children. That was a calamity because they didn't have any food. 
Even that day, you met the needs and you showed your strength. But most of all, you have looked at the most ultimate, most disastrous disease of all, the disease of sin. The most devastating virus that has ever been. And you died on the cross for our sins. You paid the price so we could go to heaven. And you rose from the dead to demonstrate your power over death. Praise to your name. Glory to your name. Worship and honor be to the name of the King of Kings. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. We bless you. And now we give you glory. We pray that as we move into this week, we could do so with faith. And when we feel the fear that we would hear your voice, knowing that you will take care of us. Through Christ we pray. Amen.